Welcome to Christ Fellowship Everywhere. We are so excited that you are joining us today, wherever you're tuning in from. We want to say welcome home because often around here, we say that church is not just a building you walk into, but it really is a family that you can belong to. So welcome to the family. Today is going to be such an exciting day. My name is Kalisa, and this is your online community pastor, Daniel. Hey, welcome. We always like to say show up and say hello. Say hello in the chat. We'd love to be able to connect with you. So you might be like Frank and Sebring. It's always great to have you here with us. So faithful every single week. So let us know, Elaine from Michigan. We always love having you around. Actually, Elaine, I'm going to send you an email this week. All right. So I have something that I want to ask you about if you would... um, yeah, so, so be, on the be, be ready, be Always ready for be that, ready. all right? <laughs> See, we know we know these people, all right? So we'd love to be able to connect and uh, say hello to our online community. So it's so great to have everyone here. We have a great Sunday plan. So let us know that you're joining us in the chat. We got yeah, a great one. That's right. And if you've been with us the past few Sundays, you know that we have been in a series called Tug of War. Yeah. Now, this is all about relationships. Like our pastors have done a deep dive in how we can win at relationships. And I think we believe, and we hope you believe, that it's more than just a message, that it really is something that you can take home with you, that you could utilize throughout your week. So our team has put together some really great tools and resources like groups and classes, podcasts that are designed with you guys in mind. And I'm not a parent yet. But this stuff's really helpful. But my parent friends, <laughs> they right. have some really great life hacks, but they also have some parent fails. You, Hashtag parent fails. You know, sometimes <laughs> it happens. Actually, um, pastors James and Lisa Duvall joined the Crew Cast and Sisterhood podcast this week. They shared some of their parenting fails. And so that kind of got me thinking, hey, let's scour the internet. Let's pull some parenting fails and uh, let's bring the, the best ones to you. The first one here says... Uh, my dad told me the ice cream truck only played the sound when I, all the ice cream was gone. <laughs> only when the ice cream was gone. I don't really know if that's a fail. I think that's a parent win. That, that might be a win. That's pretty. I mean, it's a fail for the kids, but uh, I think that one's pretty great. Um, here's else? another one what though. Uh, the guard fell off the clippers when my mom is giving me a haircut. Ooh. So she filled in the missing spot with a magic marker. With a Sharpie. I'm sorry about that, oh, kid. That's uh, a permanent marker. Yeah, that's that's rough. Well, we also have some for, for from life. our hosts <laughs> as well. So uh, this is from our own Jonathan Samuels. All right, hey, I want yeah. to challenge my kids to a handstand competition. It says I fell over and actually accidentally knocked my four year old son out. Out. <laughs> Hashtag Ouch. parent fail. Yes, that <laughs> that one works. Um, I, I have my own parent fail. Uh, my son told me that it was pajama day at school and. Oh. I just believed him. I never checked. So we pull up to school and I just hear, oh no, oh no, oh no. Turns out it was not pajama not day. Not pajama day. And I was like, get out. I was like, go, <laughs> go endure the uh, the torment that you're about yeah. to. Maybe it's a kid fail. It, kid was, fail. it was pretty great. Yeah, it was a kid fail, but I did have to go bring him clothes later in the oh. day. So I got a call from his teacher. I was like, all right, he endured enough. Oh man, right. we like to have fun around here. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesome. So, you know, sometimes parent fails happen, but we want to help you. We have lots of great resources for you to be able to equip you as a parent. And one of the things that happened last week, uh, Pastor Ryan Leak was here and just shared an incredible message about how we can help in our relationship so we don't have that parent fail. Right. And he shared this one phrase that we must get right. Check this out. I think there are four words that will drastically change every relationship you have in perhaps every polarizing conversation you could have in 2024. If you insert these four words, I promise you, you will make every polarizing conversation you have a little bit more palatable. It's the words, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but here's my perspective. I could be wrong, but here's what I think our country needs. I could be wrong, but here's what I think our, our business needs. I could be wrong, but this is what I'm feeling in our marriage. But some of us, we live with rightness and I got to win. No, you got to win the relationship, not the argument. Uh, Here's why the words I could be wrong are so vitally important for every relationship you have. If you can't say I could be wrong, then you will never say these words. I was wrong because you don't even think it's possible. And if you can't say I was wrong, you'll never say these. I am wrong. And here's what I know about you and me. Haven't we all had somebody in our life that got us wrong? 
So isn't it possible that we're currently getting somebody else wrong? And so for us, I think we have to have a humble posture towards complicated people to say they're complicated and so am I. And perhaps what would it look like for God's grace to reign in this relationship? Come on. Ooh, what a so message. Good. I'll tell you what, we're going to practice that right now. So I want you to put, I could be wrong in the chat. Type, I could be wrong in the chat. And we'll choose a winner. We'll give you a free Ryan Leak book. After worship, we'll, we'll announce yeah. a winner. So I could be wrong in the chat. You yes. can win today. So go ahead and do that. But hey, we have a great service in store for you yeah. today. We're going to join the room in just a few moments for worship. And during our service today, we're actually going to have a time of communion. So make sure you grab your elements, some juice, some bread, some crackers, so you can partake in that with us. Then you're going to hear an incredible message from Pastors Todd and Julie Mullins. And really, it's time to lean in. Like, yeah. it's time for us to get our Bibles. It's time to get our notebooks so we can lean in in time for worship. So let's join the room. Welcome to church. Welcome to Christ Fellowship. Hey, and welcome everyone here at our Palm Beach Gardens location. A special greeting to everyone joining us online, especially Miss Amanda, who's going for a morning walk right now in Virginia Beach. Amanda, I just need to tell you today, God is with you, and I'm so glad that you would join us for church before you go to your church in Virginia Beach. Come on, what a way to start your day. And I, so I've got a scripture verse for all of us, but for you, Amanda and Zephaniah, the Old Testament, uh, they write, uh, God wins victory after victory, and He's with you. And then He celebrates over you, and He sings over you, and He refreshes your life with His love today. I want you to know that's a promise for all of us, that God is going to restore and refresh, give you new energy and new strength as we walk in Him. Amen? Come on, let's celebrate Him today. Yeah, yeah.
word that simply means that we are going to give God our highest praise. It is going to be full of thanksgiving. It's going to be full of joy today. For He is worthy to be praised. Amen. My goodness, my goodness, it is good to be in this room and worshiping with us today. Uh, everywhere, uh, Everyone who's with us at Christ Fellowship online today, special greeting to all the men and women in the United States Armed Forces who might be worshiping with us at home or abroad today. So grateful to have you with us. Wow. Hey, before you have a seat today, turn around to somebody and say, he deserves the highest praise. Come on, tell him. He deserves the highest praise today. I love that we can worship the name of Jesus together. Well, welcome home, church family. My name is Kalisa, and I am so excited that you are joining us today. We have an incredible service planned out for you. But if you joined us for our pre-service experience, then you know that we did a book giveaway. Ryan Lee came and preached last weekend, and we want to make sure that you walk away with a gift. And so we picked a winner. It's Ed Cortez. Ed Cortez, congratulations. You won a brand new book. So you can go ahead and email online at cf.church to get your free Ryan Leak book, but it's going to be incredible. So make sure that you do that and our host will get you connected with that as well. But hey, we have so many ways that you can get connected right here at Christ Fellowship Church. We have Joyce Meyer preaching tonight at our Gardens campus. We have John Maxwell, who's going to be joining us next weekend. And here at Christ Fellowship Church, we are celebrating 40 years. Can you believe that? 40 years we're celebrating celebrating of Christ Fellowship being right here. And we want to make sure that you join us for all of our special services that we have coming up. So that's going to be next weekend. So make sure that you're a part of it. You can stay up to date with everything that we have going on around here by texting the word info to 441441. But before we jump into our service today, before the message, you can go ahead and check out in the studio. We have pastors Carissa and Daniel to share. Into that parenting class. So much, Kalisa. Yes, I'm here with Carissa Robinson, who leads all of our foster care and adoption initiatives here at Christ Fellowship. And I wanted to bring you in because May is Foster Care Awareness Month. And so I'd love if everyone could hear directly from you, just what are we doing as a church around that initiative? Yeah, super glad to be here. You know, in the U.S., thousands of kids every year are removed from their home and placed in foster care and to no fault of their own. They're removed because they've been abused or abandoned or neglected. And you know, this is culture's problem, but we do believe that the church needs to step up and be a part of the solution. And as a church, you and me, we're a part of that every single day. We've got partner ministries that we come alongside of, financially support, while they're boots on the ground, licensing Christian foster homes to take in these children and care for them. In fact, we're going to link their websites. That's for kids and Place of Hope. They're amazing ministries doing amazing work. And we're a part of it every day as we give. In fact, when we rolled out the vision to get there first as a Christ Fellowship Church, we knew we needed to step up and get there first in the lives of some of the most vulnerable kids in our church, the foster and adoptive yeah. kids. And so this is what birthed our Kids Night Out events. In fact, just Friday night, we had one of these events here at the Gardens campus with almost 100 kids that got dropped off for three hours while their parents got to go out. Some just like took a nap in their car. <laughs> Some went out to go grocery shop or maybe clean their house, you know, while they don't have kids. And we had a rodeo theme. So we had a petting zoo. So kids had pony rides for the first time ever. But we also had a dynamic teaching. And we told them that Jesus loves them. And there's a church here for them that no matter where life takes them, the church of Jesus Christ is always gonna be there for them. And it was really a beautiful time together. And I just wanna encourage you, church, you're a part of that. As you give, you are a part of making an impact in the lives of some of the kids that really need it most in our community. Yeah, that's, that's an incredible thing. Thank you for all that you do, the teams that you lead, and really helping us as a church make sure that we're investing in this area of ministry. So uh, that's right, when you give, you are a part of this. And so Chris, could you pray for our time of offering and also all all of the work that we do in foster care and adoption ministry. Yeah, well, Jesus, thank you for the gift that we have to come alongside of culture to really be a part of the solution. And so as we give, we pray that you would use our offering to impact some of the most vulnerable and desperate kids in our community. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. That's so cool. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move to a time of communion now. Before the message, we're going to have some time where we're going to worship together and we're going to introduce a new song. So the team's going to introduce a song called Plead the Blood. And this goes back to the Jewish festival of Passover. So if you think back in the day, Israelites were in Egypt, they were slaves in captivity, the plagues, the whole deal, right? Uh, maybe you've seen a cartoon when you were young, uh, but that's a that goes back to this this time of Passover, where in order to get out of uh, out of slavery of Egypt, uh, God had the Israelites put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts, and as God's Spirit passed over them, those people that had blood on their doorposts, they were saved. Their lives were spared. They were able to experience freedom as they left Egypt and got out of slavery. Well. It kind of sounds a little bit similar, doesn't it? We have Jesus who is our pure and spotless lamb. And so what does Jesus do? He, um, you know, he, he gave his life freely for us. And so as Jesus offered his life, as he shed his blood, it's his blood that forgives us. It's his blood that spares our life. It's his blood that we find forgiveness and freedom for our lives. And so yeah. that's an important thing. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And I love that the blood of Jesus still represents that in yeah. our life today. You know, I think about the times that are just really difficult in my life. I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. That's the act of like what the Israelites did, putting it over your doorstep. I'm putting it over the doorstep of the hardest things in my life to go. The blood of Jesus covers even the hardest moments in my life. Yeah, that's right. So this is something that's relevant for us today. Actually, Passover is celebrated this week. Uh, Monday is Passover. But even in our lives, we always have that aspect where we can go back and say, hey God, I, I need you. I plead with you, your blood frees me, it forgives me, it saves me. And that that's the spirit that we want to pray over in this time. And so we are going to experience communion together. And so this is an opportunity for you to get something to eat, get something to drink. And we'll do that together here in a moment. And it can be whatever elements you have around the house. But I love how Jesus in his final days, uh, as his, he's celebrating Passover with his disciples, that's where we get this idea of communion. He takes these elements. He, that were a part of the Passover meal, a part of this meal where they go back and they think about how quickly they had to leave Egypt, how quickly uh, they had to get out of there to experience hope and freedom. And this is an opportunity for us to... um, to, to go back to that and to remember the last night where he took the bread, he broke the bread and said, hey, this is my body. And he took the cup and he said, hey, this represents my, my blood. This is how you remember what I'm about to do on the cross. How each time we come together and we take communion, we're, we're remembering Jesus. We're remembering this thing of Passover and just really going back to, to say, hey, I need you in my life. So that's the tone, that's the spirit that I want us to think about as we worship together. every weapon that's formed The thief and his plan will pass over When he sees the red on the door I plead the blood I plead the blood of Jesus I plead the blood Plead the blood of Jesus. If the enemy can't take my family, this house belongs to the Lord. So I'm not afraid to remind him that he has no claim in this war. I plead the blood.
but the blood No, nothing but the blood What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but His blood Paul writes it this way in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. He says, In Him, through Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins because of the riches of God's grace. See, the symbols that we hold in our hands today are reminders of the grace of God, the broken body of Jesus and His blood that was shed for us. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let's eat of the bread together. In the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup represents a new covenant. My blood that'll be shed once and for all for the forgiveness of sins not by anything we could merit or achieve. Simply, this is the free gift of God today. The blood of Jesus Christ washing us white as snow, forgiving us of our sins today. Let's drink of the cup together. And so Jesus with grateful hearts, we're reminded today that there is nothing in this life that we could simply do, but other than to receive your grace and your blood. And so we pray that as it would be washing over us afresh and anew today, that we would be reminded of the life that you have called us to, that life that is truly life. For what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but Everybody said, Amen. You can be seated. Welcome everybody Hello, welcome joining everybody. us today at all of our Christ Fellowship locations, everybody at our Gardens campus, everybody online. It is so good to be together to worship Jesus together today. Well, we are wrapping up our relationship series that we're calling Tug of War because that's how a lot of our relationships feel. 
One person pull it against the other person. Husband against wife, kids against their parents, coworker against coworker. And we really believe that that is not the way it has to be. Yeah, last week, Ryan Leak reminded us that, that relationships are complicated, right? I had this reality check when Todd confirmed that I am complicated. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say I was complicated. I, no, I had no idea. But, but I am complicated. We're all complicated. And we're in relationships with complicated people. True. And because this is all complicated, we know that we can't cover everything in a three-week series. And so we have some incredible resources for you and some opportunities for you. We have, we have prep for marriage. Yeah. If you're even thinking about marriage to, to get started on the right foot, we've got re-engage at so many of our locations for marriages, not just that are in crisis, but to fortify your marriage. Right. We have parenting classes. We, we just launched a podcast to, yeah. to help you out with relationships, all kinds of things. But we also have a financial change class because we realize that so many, so many are struggling in their finances. It's one of the leading causes of divorce. Yeah. And we don't want to just end the series right now. Right. We want to be able to help you in the long run. So make sure you check out those resources. And we want to remind you why we started this series. As we were praying about this time together, uh, God really laid it on our heart that the reason the reason we need to do this is because there is an all out spiritual attack on the family. Like there is an attack against marriage, against God's design for marriage between one man and one woman. There is an attack against family, against parents and kids. And if you don't know it, your family and your relationships are under attack. And week one, we kicked off by, by looking at a scripture in Ephesians chapter six that I want to touch on again today. And this is the Apostle Paul talking about relationships. And he says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And this is a huge yeah. revelation. Yeah. You've got to remember who you're fighting. So when you get hurt by uh, that friend, that family member, that coworker, it's not them, it's the devil. And you may say, well, Todd, I know they are the devil. <laughs> no, that's not what the scripture means. Jesus actually says you have a real enemy. And in John 10, 10, he said that enemy comes to rob, kill and destroy. He wants to rob you of your relationships, rob you of your joy and your peace that you only find when your relationships are good. Yeah, you know, in that passage, it goes on to say, he unpacks, the Apostle Paul unpacks the, the spiritual armor that we need to put on to equip ourselves for battle. He talks about the helmet of salvation that's gonna guard our mind. And we talked in week one about the belt of truth that, that's, gonna, that's gonna give us support, like at our core. This belt is gonna strengthen us yep. and it gives us spiritual authority in right. this battle. But then it goes on that in verse 16, he says that above all, above all of these things, to lift up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. What Paul is literally saying right here is that your enemy, he is shooting at you right now flaming arrows into your relationship, right? But this is not even the arrow that he's talking about, right? right? The arrows that he's talking about that, that the Roman soldiers would have been fighting with were, were this kind of arrow. And, and this arrow was more like a, a javelin. Yeah. And these arrows would actually be dipped in tar, lit on fire, and the enemy would hurl them into, enemy, in, into the opponent's camp. And even though this was a weapon that, that was meant to kill, but more, more likely it was used to, to create chaos, to cause confusion, yep. to cause distraction, yep. because what they would do is they would actually light the camp on fire. And when everyone in the army was so busy putting out the fire, that was when they could be easily overtaken. Yeah. And see, this is what the enemy does. Yes, he he does. actually throws spiritual fiery darts yes. into your relationships to get, you, to, to get you confused, to create chaos, to create this distraction and keep us from, from recognizing the spiritual battle that we're in. Right. See, even though our enemy is invisible, he is not fictional. Right. And he is causing, he, he's causing chaos in our relationships with these fiery darts. And so today, we wanna talk about some of those fiery darts that he's hurling that are creating this confusion and, and, and distraction and disunity. We wanna uncover three of those fiery darts. And the first one is so important that we believe that we've seen so many relationships that have been taken out by this fiery dart. And this is the, the fiery dart of offense. 
The dart, the of arrow, offense, of, the arrow offense. of offense. I actually believe it is one of the most constant, subtle attacks that the enemy is putting against us today, the spirit of offense. We get hurt by what someone says, by what someone does, by what they don't do, by what they, they didn't say to me, and an offense builds up in our heart. Can you believe they said that? Can you believe they looked at me that way in the office today? Honey, it wasn't you, it was the Taco Bell that they had for lunch today. <laughs> Taco Bell would just do that. The truth is though, we live in a time when people are so easily offended that a lot of our relationships feel like we're walking on eggshells. Now in the Bible, when that word offense is used, several times it is the Greek word scandalone. Scandalone means trap and specifically the part of the trap where the bait is set. So that when an animal steps on or goes to take that bait, the trap closes and captures the animal. So literally offense is a trap of the enemy to hold people in captivity, to hold you and me in captivity. A, a friend of ours, John Bevere, wrote a book years and years ago called The Bait of Satan, where he unpacks that the bait of Satan is this offense where people get hurt and offended and it ends up uh, damaging relationships. And before we even know it, we're caught up in it because of some disagreement or something that happened 10 years ago and we're still carrying around with us this spirit of being offended. It says this in Proverbs 18, 19, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city and contentions are like the bars of a castle. Think about that, that, that a brother who is offended is, hard to, is harder to win than a strong city. So what he's saying there is when we are offended, we have a tendency to build up walls to protect ourselves, to protect our heart from further hurt or offense, right? But those walls that we build up actually lead to isolation. They, they keep people out. They keep people locked out. But actually, the walls of protection become a prison, and we become the, the prisoners. Now, we've told you this story before. When we were uh, first married, uh, we went backpacking across Europe, and I thought we had a great time. Uh, I'm not sure if Julie agrees or not, but while we were in London, we were on the, the train, and every time the doors opened, we would hear over a crackling speaker in a very thick British accent these words, mind the gap, mind the gap, please. And we're like, what, what are they saying? Mind the gap, mind the gap. We're like, what, what's a gap? I don't know what a gap is. But what they were saying was mind the gap the gap. And you've seen that little statement, mind the gap. And we realized once we got off the train at our stop that there was this quite large gap at the time between the platform and the train, big enough that a 20-year-old carrying a backpack could be lost in between that space. And so as it is in our relationships, we have to mind, mind the, gap. the gap. We have to pay attention to gaps when they're created in our relationships because gaps are the spaces where relationships are vulnerable. And I wanna illustrate that for you. Um, I have a few volunteers that are come on up here. We've got Pastor Dave and Rhonda, Lewis and Kalisa, Tyler, give it up for these guys. They're amazing. Dave, Pastor Dave and Lewis, why don't you come on up here? And so this is what this kind of looks like in every relationship. This could be your marriage, this could be your friendship, maybe a parent-child relationship. But, but for this illustration, I'm gonna take Dave and Lewis here. And Dave and Lewis, they're, they're brothers. And, and they, they, they're in a group together, but they also work together. And this is how it happens. See, they're walking around shoulder to shoulder, everything's looking good, until one day, Lewis does something that kind of offends Dave, right? Uh -oh. um, yeah, so, so he, he, he says something that kind of rubs him the wrong way, and then he actually takes credit for a project that they've been working on together. And so Dave's a little bit offended, so it creates this little space, a little bit of gap here. Well, Dave, he's actually, he, he's a fighter. He's got some fight in him, so he doesn't mind, you know, some, some la launching some angry words Lewis's way. He's like, you always do that. I can't believe you. And, and you call yourself a Christian. And so he's like, yeah, he, he's like, you know, upset. Well, Lewis, he's, he's a little bit conflict avoidant. And so he starts to give Dave the silent treatment, uh -oh. yeah. right? So yeah. he gives him the silent treatment. So the gap gets a little bit wider. Time, go, time goes by. Well, he doesn't talk to Dave about it, but he does talk to his wife, Kalisa. Kalisa, he tells Kalisa everything that's going on and, 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 and 
She begins to get offended at Dave, and then Rhonda gets in the picture because Dave definitely goes home and talks to Rhonda about yeah. it. And then Tyler, he, he just wants to pray for his brothers, right? Oh, yeah. And so he begins to get involved, and all of a sudden, you know, this makes it a little bit awkward because Kalisa and Rhonda are friends, and small group's a little awkward now. And so all of a sudden, there, what began as a small spark has gone into a full-blown conflict. Yeah. And, and more people are involved. Yep. See, there was no sin in the original. Lewis didn't even intend to take the credit, right? Yep. No sin there. But the sin started when there were the angry words yep. that were spoken, yep. right? When there were assumptions made, when yes. gossip started, yep. when, when we picked up somebody else's offense. Right. And this is what happens. And this is so important because so many times in relationships, our problem isn't the problem. Yeah. It's our response to the problem that becomes the problem. Yep. And so when a gap is created, it is so important that we do something about it, that we fill the gap with the right things yes. and that we fill the gap quickly. Yes. So guys, thank you guys so much. Why don't you give it up for these guys? You guys are awesome. Awesome offenders, awesome, yeah. <laughs> so when offense happens and that gap is created, it's important to close the gap quickly in any relationship. Two ways that you and I can do that. The first way is overlook the small stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of small things that we get easily offended about. And Proverbs 19 says, overlook it. A person, Proverbs 19, 11, a person with good sense, and you're a person with good sense, is patient, and it is to his credit that he overlooks an offense. That means you let it go. It's a small thing, just let it go. Sometimes we let the littlest things become the biggest problems. Let me put it this way. Um, don't let the little thing ruin the big thing. Yeah. The big thing's the relationship. Don't let a little thing ruin that big thing, right? You gotta, you gotta overlook. So when they come home at the end of the day and they're a little bit tired and grumpy, just give them a little space, all right? Give me a little space. Uh, when, <laughs> when, uh, when, when the person doesn't text you back right away when you text them, you know, it's okay. You even see the bubble moving. You're like, they, I know they got my text. Just give them a minute. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what's happening. When your boss does something that you just drives you crazy, just overlook the small things. The second way is you've got to make the first move. Yeah. You go first. Now we're talking about fighting for the relationship and we're talking about closing the gap quickly. And the quickest way you can close the gap is you go to the other person first. Jesus is the one that came up with this when he said in Matthew chapter five, verse 23, that if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, there's a, there's a gap, there's an offense that's happened. What does he say to do? He says, leave your gift there in the altar. And he says, first yep. you go, you is implied, first you go yep. and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So Jesus is saying, you go first. He's saying, make the first move, take responsibility. Yeah, yeah I love that because when, when we make the first move, we take the step, you're actually engaging in spiritual battle. You are right. fighting for the relationship. Right. You're creating this space where forgiveness can happen. Yep. You're creating a space where, where you're actually gonna be able to prefer somebody else's needs above your own. Right. So what this means is that if, if Todd and I are in an argument, right, we're in conflict, and, and even if I think that I am 98% right. Think is the word there that and, you need to focus on. And he on. is 98% wrong. I still have to take 100% responsibility of my 2%. Yeah. Because this is about a relationship here, right? right? And so when, when you think about that, sometimes the, the taking the 100% the responsibility is making that first move yes. and apologizing, right? I mean, and, and apologizing for, for even when you don't know that you've done something wrong. Right. And when I think about this, I think about, you know, just the fact that we say all the time that, that every great relationship, every great friendship, every great marriage is made up of two really good forgivers. Right. But I would probably add to that, that it's not just made up of two really good forgivers, but two really great apologizers. See, this is, this is a key in relationships. Have you ever heard a bad apology? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that you were offended by what I said, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I, I'm so sorry that you took that the wrong way. I've never said it that You've way. You've never said it, right? I'm so sorry, but if you had just done what I said in the first place, we wouldn't be in this situation. These are really bad apologies. And so when we talk about making the first move, we're actually closing that gap we were talking about. And making the first move means first that you're gonna acknowledge, acknowledge the other person's feelings. Yeah. 
and emotions, right? And, and, we, and um, Ryan Leake talked about this last week, that, that you initiate the conversation. I love what he said. When you initiate the conversation, you say, I could be wrong. It's, it's acknowledging that, that you could be at fault. Right. It, right. It's also saying that, that I can tell that there's something between us and I care too much about this relationship right. to let it go in the wrong direction. Right. This is a spiritual battle that we're in. We're gonna fight for the relationship by acknowledging the other person's feelings first and then, then admitting when you're wrong. So when you find out that I was actually more than 2% wrong, you know, I, I'm actually about 98% wrong, that it, it shifts a little bit, then you have to admit when you're wrong, take responsibility. Even if it's only the 2%, I'm gonna own my words. I, I, I'm so sorry for the way that my words and my actions impacted you. And it's not the time to defend myself, it's, it's admitting that you're wrong, be specific. Yeah. Or if you know that, that you've broken trust, because we're, sometimes we're not talking about small offenses, right. it might be a bigger offense, you've broken trust, or, or you've actually, um, you've betrayed someone, and, and trust has been broken in a relationship, be specific, right. admit that you're wrong. Asking for forgiveness is the only way forward. That's right. But after you admit you're wrong, we have to alter our behavior. Right, because so many times, you know, this has been such a—it's always a, a fiery dart that gets into our relationships. Is when when we when we say we're sorry, but then we keep doing the same thing over yeah. and over. Yeah. But we've got to alter our behavior, especially if trust has been broken. Be willing to do the hard work. Right. Be willing if if you have if if you have a problem keeping commitments, you need to get some accountability about keeping your commitments. Right. If if you have done something that um, that is broken trust, you need to take the initiative, get counseling, get whatever you need, do whatever you need to do to better yourself so that you can you can resolve not only resolve the issue but restore the relationship. We got to do what we need to do. See, because whenever we, we do this, when we do this, we make the first move, we are actually putting our faith over our feelings. Right. When we do the hard thing, even when it's hard, we're, we're elevating the shield of faith over our feelings. Right. And when we do this, we are actually, we're, we're actually putting out, extinguishing the fiery arrow of offense right. that's come into right. the relationship. Right. This is spiritual battle. But let me just tell you that, that if the enemy can't get you with this fiery arrow, he's got another one, right, ready to hurl into your relationships. And, and the, one of the attacks that we have seen so blatantly, and probably the most, that has had such a devastating effect on so many of your relationships, that's caused so much chaos, that's robbed complete families of joy and peace and, and actually stolen people's purpose, is the fiery arrow of unforgiveness. That's right. The arrow of unforgiveness is when you are convinced that you should not or there's no way you could forgive that person for what they've done. You're just convinced. It's too hard. But this is what Colossians 3.13 says. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another. And then say that last part with me out loud wherever you are. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think about how the Lord forgave you. He, he forgave you completely, right? Without hesitation and without reservation. He freely forgave you. Think about that. Think about how often the Lord has forgiven you. You can't even count how many times, right? Because the Bible says in Psalm 86 that the Lord is ready to forgive. In James 5, he says the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He's not stingy with it. So this scripture of loving the way God, forgiving the way that we've been forgiven, it's really not an unreasonable demand because we've been forgiven of so much. And what God wants from us is all about the freedom he has for us. So when he's wanting you to give away forgiveness, it's really all about you. I mean, forgiveness is the gift you give that's not for the other person. It's for you, it releases you. It takes you away from the burden. So the best way to define forgiveness, I think, is to start by saying what it's not. First of all, forgiveness is not an excuse for bad behavior. When you forgive somebody, it's not that you're just saying what they did was okay. You're actually saying what you did was not okay, that it actually requires me to forgive you. So you're not excusing what they did, you're not writing it off. Second thing is, forgiveness uh, doesn't mean there's not gonna be consequences. Like there are still consequences. I've heard people um, 
say before, they've done some things that have broken trust in a serious way. And they're like, well, I said I was sorry. Gosh, can't you forgive me? Can't we just you know, move on, right? And they expect no consequences. But for trust to be built, it's gonna take some time because forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. Forgiveness can happen in a moment, but trust is actually built over time. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. You can choose um, to walk in forgiveness even if the other person walks out yeah. on you. Yeah, I think it's important that, that we know that forgiveness is not, it, it, it's not a feeling, it's a choice. It's a choice that we make. Right. Forgiveness is the choice we make that we are not going to be a victim to the pain of our past. Right. That we are not going to carry this hurt and offense with us and, and nurse it and let it become part of our identity. Right. It, this is a choice that we make. It, it's actually a choice that we make to, to allow the Holy Spirit to empower us to do something that we could never do on our own. Right. To forgive as the Lord forgave us. This is, this is really the message of the gospel that we walk yeah. in forgiveness yeah. as he forgave us. Beautiful. This is a, a spiritual work. And see, unforgiveness, it, it, it doesn't just impact the way that we, um, that, that we relate to the person who offended us. It, it actually is this cancer that metastasizes and it becomes the point that, that we filter all of our other relationships through. Yeah. And this is what happens when unforgiveness attaches itself to us. And we have seen this. We know this because we've seen it. We pray with you guys at the, at the, at the altar at week after week. And there's not a week that goes by that we're not praying for someone about this. Yeah. And I remember um, a, a while back, I was, I was praying with a woman who had been divorced for 15 years. And she was there with her adult son. And she was wanting to release it, but she said, but what, what my ex-husband did was so egregious that I can't forgive him. It was, there's just no way I can. And, and the son is begging her to forgive for the past 15 years. This family had been robbed of the joy of every family event, right. every Easter, every Christmas, yep. every wedding celebration. It was, there was a, a cloud of bitterness over it. And now there were grandchildren coming into the picture. Now this, this generational, this generational unforgiveness was taking a toll on them. Yep. And so, so this, this unforgiveness was actually impacting every relationship, robbing them, robbing her of her purpose for 15 years. Wow. And this is the deal is that, that if you think that your unforgiveness is only affecting you, it is a lie. Yep. It is a lie that the enemy has planted in your relationship. Yep. It's a lie that he's planted in your heart. This fiery dart that he hurled in yep. is to create this distraction to keep you unaware of the spiritual battle yep. that you're yep. in for your family, yep. for your children. Yep. We say all the time that, that unforgiveness is this poison that we drink expecting somebody else to die. Don't drink the poison. Yep. I, I believe, Julie, that forgiveness is truly the, the greatest gift you can give a relationship because none of, nobody's perfect. We're all imperfect people. And um, when you give that forgiveness to each other, it actually makes it possible for the, for the relationship to move forward, take ground, become stronger. So the last fiery dart that we want to make you aware of today is uh, the arrow of ungodly counsel. The enemy is shooting the arrow of ungodly counsel into your relationships. A couple of weeks back, we talked about how we are all being counseled on our relationships by somebody. I mean, even if we're not paying a therapist uh, to, to, to counsel us, we are being counseled by somebody or something, and you're probably paying for it one way or another. Um, we said that culture is actually a counselor when it comes to relationship, that we watch what other people are doing on social media, and we think that's how worse relationships are supposed to be lived out or played out, or we see things on TV, and we think that's how it's supposed to be played out or lived out. We, we said that the, a whole generation was uh, counseled by culture on how to have relationships by the TV show Friends. Like how they counseled many people, millions of people about relationships and marriage and dating and, and casual sex, right? But the truth is we all need counselors. We actually need allies in this battle for our relationships. Uh, and Julie, you've said before that the, uh, the only battle that we can't win is the one we try to fight alone. So we actually need the right people with us. And this is what Proverbs 24 verse six says. It says, don't go to war without, what's that word? 
wise guidance. Don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. So notice he says there, it's not just talking about having guidance or counsel, but he's actually saying you gotta have wise guidance, wise counsel. So where do we get that wisdom from? Where does wisdom come from? Well, let me draw your attention to Proverbs 9, verse 10. Why don't you say this with me out loud, wherever you are. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Say that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, in that verse, fear does not mean to be afraid of God. It means to have a holy reverence and awe for God, for his truth, for who he is, for his authority over our lives, that he is God and we are not. And when you have that holy fear, he says right there, that's where wisdom begins. So where you get counsel from, this is why you need wise counsel and not ungodly counsel, it will determine whether your relationships are gonna thrive or even survive. Yeah, you know, um, we all need these counselors and there's a few counselors that, that we know that we need. The first one is that godly counsel comes from the word of God. Yep. This is where our authority comes from. And I know that sounds completely obvious, but I am amazed that, that even as Christ followers, we can, get, we can get sucked into some really bad counsel, yep. really bad advice that does not come from God's word. You know, if you watch any reality TV show, right, one of the most popular pieces of advice that's given is follow your heart. heart. Have you seen who they choose? They never choose the right person. <laughs> This is terrible advice. Follow your heart. This is, this is, this, what this is saying is that if it feels good, go for it. Yeah. So, so if, the, if that guy that, that you want to date or that girl, if, even if they, they are, their, their, their lifestyle doesn't line up with the purpose that God has on your life, if it feels good, mm. just follow your heart. Go for it. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. It says that there is a way that appears to be right. There is a way, there is a road, there is a path that appears to be right, but the end of it leads to death. Yeah. It may seem right, right, it may feel easier, right. it may feel easier to hold on to unforgiveness than to let it go, but, but just because it, it feels right doesn't mean it's the right way. In yeah. the end, it's not leading you to the relationships that yeah. God has yeah. for you. Yeah. And I have seen so many people make decisions, the worst decisions, from a place of a broken heart. You know, your heart is beautiful. It has a great capacity to love, but it was never intended to be your leader. Right. Your heart has never been intended to lead you. You have to be led by the counsel of the word yep. of God. Yep. Yep. Um, the Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in everything you do and that he will direct your path. Your, your heart isn't intended to lead. It's, it's been called to trust. Yes. And so there is always gonna be a time when, when our faith and our feelings are gonna be at odds with each other. Right. And whenever those time, when that time comes, we have to be resolved that we are gonna get our counsel from the word of God. That's right, so you need, you need God's word. The second counsel you need there is you need godly mentors in your life, right? So many times we settle for what our friends uh, tell us that we want to hear. We let them counsel us, right? And, uh, and oftentimes what we want to hear is not what we need to hear. <laughs> I mean, they're usually very different. And your friends are probably great. They love you and they want you to be happy. So sometimes they will say things that are for your happiness. Like uh, uh, you deserve to be happy. So if you're not happy in that marriage, just get out of the marriage. Well, I don't, I don't find that in the scripture anywhere. Hold on. Yeah, I, I don't see it anywhere say that if you just want to be happy, you can walk out on your marriage and follow your heart. It's not in there. So you actually need godly mentors. Now, I'm not saying there are not biblical grounds for divorce. Um, there are when someone's been unfaithful or in a situation of abuse because God doesn't want anybody to stay in an abusive uh, relationship. But what I am saying is there are relationships that are worth fighting for and you need some allies that are stronger and more equipped than you are. You need some godly, wise mentors that know the word of God, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, yeah. that have seen God move in people's lives, that have seen what happens when forgiveness is given and trust is given yeah. and rebuilt and they've seen some things that you haven't seen, yeah. you need to get them in your life. They actually will also um, force you to have some hard conversations. Yeah, they're gonna challenge you yeah. and challenge you in the truth of God's word. And you know, I think about, um, I've got a couple of friends who are marriage mentors to a lot of young couples and they had a young couple come to them and they were struggling in their marriage. They had a couple of young kids and this young couple's friends, their peers were saying, hey, if you're unhappy, you need to get out now. 
I mean, you, you shouldn't stay together for the kids. And our godly friend said, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Like, what better reason to stay together than for the kids? Yep. Because this is, this is a generational thing, because who knows if you stay together, yep. if you stay together, what, what if you get some really great resources, some people around you yep. that are praying, that are believing for yep. you, yep. which you cannot believe yep. for yourself. Who knows? The passion may return. Yep. The intimacy will return. But why would you just walk out now? So this, this, they have seen, these are mentors that have seen, yes. you know, marriages that were torn apart, that were brought back together. They, they believed and have faith. You need to be around godly people that are going to believe for your relationships, what you can't even believe for yourself. That's great. That, and don't give in too soon. They're going to challenge you with yep. that. So there's godly mentors, the word of God, and then the, the, to let the word counsel us. But then there's also, there are times in our relationships, all of our relationships, that you need professional, godly therapy. Yes. Like, we believe in great therapy, right? That's gonna make you better, yep. it's gonna make your relationships better, but what we're talking about here is that counseling can be amazing, but you need a counselor that knows this word yes. and understands the truth of God's word. Yep. Why would you want relationship advice from someone who doesn't even know the author of relationships, right? Why would you want counsel from them, the one, the, the one who has a purpose and a plan for your life? And they're gonna point you back to the word of God. They're going to be limited to their own human reasoning. They may have great advice, but, but they're going to be limited to their own reasoning, to, to what they learned in college or what they're reading yeah. about in, in the latest journal. But while those clinical teachings are great, God has so much more for you. And you want godly therapists who are into the word of God. Because we have seen, boy, we have seen this dart get hurled yeah. into so many yeah. relationships yeah. that if you're not happy, it's time to walk out. Right. That you need to, you, you're, you are number one. We've actually had people that we've counseled before that, that have told us that, that when their marriage hit a rough spot, that their counselor asked them, hey, would you maybe be open to an open marriage? Maybe, maybe redefining the boundaries of sexual intimacy, inviting other people. This is a fiery arrow yep. that the enemy is throwing into your relationship that is going to destroy, yes. it's going to cause chaos, yes. it's going to impact generations, yes. and we need to know, we need to know what, what the arrow looks like, what yep. the battle looks like, yep. so that we can make sure that we are fighting against it and only taking counsel from people that are gonna counsel us in the truth of God's word. That's right. we, and as your pastors, we yeah. so want for you to experience the freedom and the life and the joy when yeah. you've got the right godly Council. Now, we've talked about these fiery arrows that the enemy is throwing at you, um, but God has given us one piece of armor that actually extinguishes the fiery darts, and it's that shield of faith, right? Now, to a Roman soldier, the shield was really important because the shield was actually his protecting. When he would take the shield, and when he knew that a fiery dart was coming his way, when they were going to be under attack, the army would go and they would dip the shields in water to get them wet. So when they held them up and they took formation side by side, shoulder to shoulder, the shields actually built a protective wall around all of them that no fiery dart could get into. And when you're in a place where there are other people, other men and women of God holding up their shield of faith next to your shield of faith, it protects you, it protects your relationships, it protects your families, and it brings life to everything that is most valuable in your life. And so we wanna take a moment and maybe end our service a little bit differently by giving you some extra time to think about what we've talked about and to respond to the word of God today. We're gonna lead you in a couple prayers and, and give you a moment of reflection then the campus teams are gonna come and they're gonna pray and then we've asked the teams to sing one more declaration of faith over your family and over your relationships. Julie and I love you so much and we are praying that this season is gonna be a season where you're gonna be able to look back and you're gonna see that God actually brought healing and restoration and wholeness to parts of your life and your relationships that have been torn and broken apart as you and I do what we're called to do. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray today? In this first moment of just reflection um, around the spirit of offense, ask yourself, where have I picked up offense? Some hurt or disappointment, somebody that did something and you, you just can't shake it and to the point that it's built this wall up, it's built this gap between you and them. Yeah. Identify what it is, it's a spirit of offense. It's a trap that was set by the enemy to hold you in captivity. 
Or maybe there's a person that you can't forgive. You know, you, you want to make the choice to forgive, but you feel like by making that choice, you're kind of letting them off the hook. And what they did was so wrong. And I want you to remember that, that how God has forgiven you completely without reservation is, is what we're calling you to today. And the only way that we can forgive others is to allow the forgiveness that we've received to flow through our lives. And what I'm not saying is that you're excusing what they did. I'm not saying that you're gonna feel better immediately. There's a, there's a process to dealing with the pain. But what I am saying is that today you're gonna make the choice to release the pain of your past so that you walk in freedom, the joy, the abundant life, no longer settle for the enemy robbing you of the joy, the peace, and the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. So Jesus, today we, um, we thank you first for your grace and mercy in our lives. Without that, we would not know how to even respond in this moment to the offense and the hurts of others towards us. But because you've forgiven us of so much, we are willing to lay down the offense and willing to forgive that person. Right where you are, in your own words, just whisper to the Lord what offense you're laying down today and that you forgive that person, that you're releasing it. You may have to say, help me forgive that person. I don't wanna forgive that person, but help me forgive them today, Lord. And Father, I thank you for those who had the courage to forgive today. I pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit on them. I pray, God, that as they walk out of this place, that they would be able to walk in forgiveness. I pray, God, that you would restore back what the enemy has tried to steal. I pray, Lord, that Psalm 133, that that is there here, that you're going to command a blessing. We command a blessing over your people and their relationships, that sons and daughters we brought back together, that moms and and dads we brought into oneness, that, that forgiveness of the pain of the past, that it will be that there would, there would be a, a line in the sand today, and today is a new start, a walk of freedom that we've never experienced before. It's in your name we pray. As we continue to pray with every head bowed, I want our campus pastors to come and pray over. I'm going to spend some time praying for you in this series as we talk about relationships. I know it can uncover a lot as we think about specific relationships, as we think about past hurts that we need to deal with and we need to reconcile with. That we need to take our 100% of our 2% to make it right. And so, Father God, I wanna pray for everyone that is watching right now, God, that you would continue to do a work inside of them. Father, I pray that you would give them your courage to admit fault where they need to. I would. Pr- I pray that you would give them your courage to take a step and initiate and work to make this situation better. Father, you want freedom for us. You want forgiveness for us. You have so much to offer. And God, we don't want uh, past pain and relationship issues and struggles to hold us back. So we ask for more of you, God. We ask for your spirit. We ask for your uh, vision and your insight to make things right, to be who you have called us to be. It's all because of Jesus that we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'll tell you what, this whole series, every single week, there is something there for you. And it might be, you need to watch this message again. You're gonna have to do some more work and really figure out what your next step is. But we always say, take a step. Your step might be come back next week. It it might be come back tonight. Whatever it is, we wanna encourage you to take a step forward in your faith. And in doing so, you're gonna bring glory to God. You're gonna help other people understand the good news of Jesus, that he loves us and he saves us and he's here for us. Hey, well, we love you so much, church. We'll see you next week. All the things that are going on, there's so many opportunities for you to jump in. We can't wait for it. Love you, take care.